So yeah, also when you're looking at these crashes, trying to um, exploit them, you know, use Bang Exploitable, see what it says, see if it knows what you think. Um, if you get one calc, try to exploit one of the other vulnerabilities. You know, there's not just this one. I'm sure some of you have seen other crashes that were a little bit different than this one. I turn on safe SEH. You did? You did. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This thing's hardened. Yeah. So then what's in the hard CDF reader hardened? Um, I forget what I put in there. <laughs> Maybe it's GS protection and variable reordering and stuff like that. No. It's safe SEH, GS, ASLR, and death. All turned on. Uh oh. Your system should, uh, you should have rebooted not into death mode here, though. But I you did. can, if you want an extra challenge, you can reboot into death mode and make your exploit bypass death as well. His point is, though, that we can't do the trivial, like just overriding the exception handler, which is the easiest thing to do because you have SEH. Yeah, you can. Oh, you can. But you can't just point it directly back at your stack. I have safe SEH turned on, so we can't. Mm -hmm. That's right. But you can do a pop pop return, right? So you can't find a pop pop return in the CDF reader executable. But why don't you look at those other DLLs supporting? Remember what I said? Application mm -hmm. DLLs do not typically opt in to all this stuff. And so I didn't look for you know the old version of Simple Direct Media Layer, whatever. I just went and downloaded some SDL, which is what I used to write the CDF reader, and put it in there, having no idea what sort of exploit mitigations it would turn on. But I sort of suspected it would pretty much be nothing. And um, you know, see what you see. Because uh, it's, it's importing a ton of application-specific DLLs to do all that 2D graphics rendering. So the game plan is, guys, so we're going to take lunch again in 11.15, just here in like 10-15 minutes. And then um, obviously you can work on this over the lunch break, and I'll give you more time after the lunch. I want everyone to get a, a calculator from a CDF document. Um, for those of you that get one quickly before others, you know, try to turn DEF on and uh, make your exploit bypass DEF, or try to find another unique crash and exploit that. And then um, once everyone gets the calculator popped up on at least one CDF crash, we'll move on to um, exploiting an old Windows vulnerability and using fuzzing to discover it. But I'm going to give you guys some time on this, at least like a couple hours with Orange and all that. All right, so guys, just uh, keep working on the lab. And um, if you want, I'll start throwing out some uh, hints into my process as I, was, as I would go through this. So for anyone that wants to follow along with me, um, I won't do it all at once because I don't want to just you know, give it away. I want you guys to probably get some more. I'll sort of uh, walk through my process for turning the crash 10.cdf into an exploit. So first things first, I'm just going to make a copy of the crash 10.cdf in case I shoot myself in the foot and you know screw up my file. That way I can revert to a original state. So I'm just copying the exploit.pdf. And what I'm going to do is I want to uh, answer some questions for myself. Where is the min copy called that corrupts the stack? I want to break right before that. I've already showed you guys how to do that once, but I'll do it again just for clarity. What are the arguments to min copy? Specifically, what is the address of the buffer and overflowing? 
Um, let's see, what is the delta between the overflowed buffer and the exception handler? So I think those are the most pertinent questions for myself right now. So theoretically what I'm going to try to do is I want to answer these questions and then um, I want to change, once I calculate like the delta between the buffer I'm overflowing and to the exception handlers, I want to replace those exception handlers with placeholder values like A's and B's. And this just demonstrate that I can gain control of EIP reliably. And that way I'll know which offset in the file represents where I'm um, overriding the exception handler and the gain control of EIP. Okay, so I showed this last time. Um, just to finding out the address where that bad min copy is called, I run it and let it crash, and then I look at the call stack. And I can see that the min copy had crashed, and the return address was at a 4018C. So if I was to look at the code around that address, I should see the call to the min copy that's corrupting everything. See, that was the return address, and this is the actual mem copy here. So I want to set a breakpoint on this 401187. That way I can look at the state of the program right before the corruption and determine the delta between the buffer I'm overflowing and that exception handler. So let's uh, restart and set a breakpoint on that address so we can look at the, uh, the MIM copy right before it actually goes. Okay, so these are my arguments passed to the, uh, the MIM copy. That means the address of the buffer I'm overflowing is 12FP80. And if I use the bang X chain, it'll tell me where these um, exception handlers are located on the stack. So 12FFB0. So the difference between 12FFB0 and the buffer I'm overflowing is offset is OX230. So at offset 230, well, here's another question we need to answer is um, the source data for this MIM copy, 3843C7, what part of the payload of the file does that represent? Because um, in this case, it's not going to represent just the beginning of the file. Because it's an MIM copying in a part of that head information into a buffer. So let's try to figure out what the source represents in the data. So ESI is still pointing at the source data. And I can see that the, uh, the source data is equal to this zero day haiku. 
So that means in my file, what's getting copied starts at offset 1F. So I'm going to make a note of that. was um, OX230. So then another question is, what offset in my file represents what will overwrite the exception handler? Can anyone tell me that with the numbers I have up there right now? So we know after 230 bytes, after we bring 230 bytes to the buffer, we're going to overwrite the exception handler that's stored on the stack from this calculation in number four. And we know that the data that's causing this overflow begins at offset 1F to the file. So the part of the file that should overwrite the exception handler is located at offset 2, 4F, 230 plus 1F in the file. I'm guessing. So I want to try to demonstrate that now by changing those values in my file with placeholder values and seeing if I get EIP equals those placeholder values when I restart it. The 1F, I saw that the, uh, the source data being copied into the buffer was a zero-day haiku. And I saw in my file, um, saw in my file that begins at offset um, 1F right here. So you can see the 7A65 and then 7A65 right here. Now, you know, I just sort of um, came to that conclusion pretty quickly. It might be the case that this data is repeated across the file several times, you know, so I could see this in the file and maybe that is the exact location of the file where it's been copied, but I know uh, pre previous experience this is the only representation of that data in the file. So this must represent an offset one after the file where this data is coming from, the source operand for the then copy. So I'll set 24F. I should write that exception handler. Let's test that theory out. 24F right here. So I'm going to change this stuff. A, 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 A. That should be the next pointer for that uh, overwritten exception handler. The next one should be the function pointer. So if all this works like I hope it will, when I restart this, I should see EIP equals. B, 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 B. Does anyone have any questions about how I do those calculations? So we know we can't replace, put EIP right at the, our shell code though, because we're writing an exception handler. 
Okay? So what do we need to point EIP to so we can eventually actually get to our shell code? Pop, pop, return. Pop, pop, return. So I need to go and find a pop, pop, return in a DLL that does not have safe SEH enabled. So I'm going to try to do that here. So political gnarly, do a hint mod, see what we got to work with. And look at this, all these application specific DLLs, like I've said over and over again, do not opt into state SEH. I didn't turn those off or do any tricks, I just downloaded the simple direct media layer, and uh, that's how they came packaged for me. So I need to find a pop pop return in one of these guys. And I'll just show you how. Um, I would go about trying to find that if I didn't have like a better gadget scanning tool available to me. So I know that just from experience, pop ESI follows return a lot, like you see pop ESI return a lot. So I'm going to um, look, figure out what the bytes are for pop ESI and search for those, those bytes in one of these um, DLLs. about this because I'm uh, telling it to assemble stuff and I'm not memory. Or just wants to be slow and crappy right now, but hopefully Wendy Bug will eventually tell us what the opcode is for Poppy SI. All right, thank you. All right, 5E is the opcode for Poppy SC. Poppy SC, 5 e So I'm going to start searching through those uh, non-safe SEH DLLs and seeing if I can find this byte construction um, in one of them, just so I can try to find one pop-up return in there. So let's start here with the uh, SDL image. These are the limits of that. So do a search there. SDL image L. size of SDL image that DLL. Not enough. Didn't find anything. Um, so what I'll do instead is I'll just look for a pop ESI. Just the 5 e byte. That's how I got that. Because the pop ESI often happens around a return just from experience looking at Windows code. And I can see these. I see a pop ESI and then a return eventually. So um, Maybe I can look at one of these and see what's going on. Why don't I do that? Here we go. That looks promise. So here's a pop-up return. That was just one way I found one. There's a bazillion, though, in these SCL modules, so you can take your pick. Just do a search for pop ESI, one of them, and then uh, look for it to be followed by a return. Disassemble around what you find and make sure you can get multiple tops, pops followed by a return. It's very common construction in these Windows DLLs, so not very hard to find. But this is the one I'm going to use, and you can write down this address as well if you want to just use the same one as me. Okay, so I'm going
What I'll do now is I'll come to uh, HXD and I'm going to replace these place order values with pop, pop, return. F7, D, E4, 6, 2. Where should that point EIP at when I uh, execute that little gadget of mine? You know, remember? Where will EIP end up? Right before. Yeah. So what I'll do is um, I'll just change these to CCs for now. And what should happen is if this pop-up return works correctly, I should see a software breakpoint right after the pop-up return executes. So I can demonstrate control that everything I think is working is actually working. Okay, so I have it uh, executing a software breakpoint. That's good. I've demonstrated control of EIP. My pop pop return definitely works because it points into a non safe SEH module. So, to reverse what I change these bytes to so I can get out of this uh, little four byte restricted area. Jump six, right? Zero six nine zero nine zero. Six and it doesn't matter what comes after this is jumping over it. So what this should do, it will keep the pop pop return point EIP at this. We only have four bytes of space though before that address of our gadget which we need. So it says, all right, EIP equals this. Let's just jump past this uh, this data I can't touch. I need that address there. And I've got all this to work with for my shell code. So if I do an EB06, that should technically point EIP at right here in my file. So if I were sorry guys. Now assuming I have enough space here past the end of my exception handler before the end of the stack, I can just copy and paste my shell code here and it would just jump to my shell code. But um, if I recall correctly, my exception handler is located at address 12FFB0. And I know my shell code is 200 bytes and so it's not going to fit in that, unfortunately. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to put my shell code in the very beginning of the buffer that I'm overflowing and then try to jump back to my buffer after I execute that EB06. I don't want to uh, walk through that step yet though. I want you guys to keep working a little bit when I'm back here. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, quick question though. I'm a little confused on yeah. something, right? So when we overwrite the function pointer that's in the SEH handler data structure, right? We're not allowed to point it at, you know, something we control directly. So we point it at a CC byte and we look at the stack and yep. stuff like that. But why is it the case that when we, when we point it immediately to a CC byte and, you know, the stack is somewhere else, why is it the case that it's always two values onto the stack is the base of the of the exception handler like so the first linked list component of it I guess I'm not clear on why if if we were in the context of the exception handler I would think that it wouldn't pass control to us passing control to CC before it did any sanity checking so I'm a little unclear on where the safe SEH sanity checking actually occurs Okay, so I showed you guys that offset 254 is effectively what's um, ending up in EIP, right? Or 253, I guess yep, it is. Yep, that's right? specifically the address I'm wondering about. Yeah, 
So you would think that, all right, EIP equals this. I can just point this at a CC byte or, at a, um, or my shell code or whatever. And uh, since uh, this value gets put into EIP, I'll be good to go. We can't point this directly at our shell code because the exception, the routine that's parsing that exception handler list when an exception happened is saying, this is one of the heuristics, just like a software dev thing. Does this point at the stack? If it does, disregard, do not use. However, we can point it directly to set a CC byte because if that CC byte is in a non-safe SCH module, it's going to say, okay, that doesn't point at a at the stack, it points to a code section, and that code section is located in a non-safe SCH module, so it's totally okay. So go ahead and make EIP equal to um, whatever I put. Okay, so that's that's the clarification on the second heuristic because I had, for instance, pointed it at, you know, forgetting the stuff from yesterday. I had pointed it at a CC within my own thing, but because my own thing was a safe SCH thing. The second heuristic is you may never point yeah. into a code region of a module that says safe SEH. Right, exactly. I mean, technically you can, but it has to point at a function, the beginning of a function that's re registered as an exception handler. So that doesn't do you much good. Right, and actually that was one thing I forgot to comment on yesterday. Um, at some point it would be good if you could show the um, component, basically where that list of of registered safe exception handlers is. Okay. So, um, so yeah, now we got cleared, that cleared up. Uh, from here, anyone that's still working on this, following me, try to see where you can get from what I just gave you, and then a little bit more, I'll try to work with the process uh, some more. Does anyone have a dev bypass working for the CDF reader as well? No? Okay. Just check. Does anyone have a dev bypass with a return oriented payload prepended to it to bypass ASLR as well? Of course, you'd have to go and find all the gadgets in those STL ones, which would be hard to do without someone just giving them to you. Okay, so I'm going to do a few more steps up here for anyone following along with me that wants some more help. So at this point, I've executed my pop pop return. Jump board six is going to put my EIP right here in the file. Because it's going to hit the pop pop return. Pop pop return is going to point EIP at these bytes right here. I change it to a jump forward 6, EP06, which is going to adjust the instruction pointer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 bytes. So if I redo this, I should get um, a debugging breakpoint with WinDebug right as EIP is equal to this. That will allow me to calculate a jump backwards to my shellcode. Now I'm going to put my shell code in the very beginning of the buffer, which I identified as being right here, Z and zero day IQ, which I found by analyzing that MIM copy call. So let me open up my shell code here. Make sure you do paste in, paste right, not paste insert. Otherwise, it'll shift everything down. So dot restart. Should hit that CC byte. Yep, right there. That's good. Now I want to calculate the relative jump backwards to my shell code. So previously, I calculated my shell code or my buffer I was overflowing was looking at address 12FP80. So if I look there right now, I should see those shellcode bytes. So let's just do that to verify. Yep, and I see the FCE889, which are the telltale signs of my calculator shellcode. Now I want to calculate that jump backwards 
So A, jump, 1, 2, FD, A0, and enter on a blank line. And I can see the bytes for the jump I need are E9, C3, FD, FF, FF. So I can just hack that into my payload where those CC bytes are currently. So I'll set 24F in my file. EB06, 0000, there's my pop pop return. This is where my CCs are at, so that's what I need to replace with my jump backwards. So E9, C3, FD, FF, FF. If I do a dot restart. Get the calculator. So, anyone have any questions about the process I just went through or would like for me to repeat that? I'm going to give you more time so you can make sure you accomplish this on your own as well. But um, I want to clear up anything with that process I just went through so it's all clear for what you're trying to do on your own.